Hello, and welcome to American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. If you like American Catholic history, become a supporter at Locals or Patreon. We've got some great perks for supporters, including interviews, gifts, live discussions, and even items we pick up on our pilgrimages and other travels. For more, visit our website, AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Help us keep this going. Also, be sure to give us a five-star rating and a great review at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. These help others to find us. Today we're talking about a family, the Barbers. A number of members of this family converted to Catholicism in 1817 and 1818. The story around them is pretty remarkable. Yeah, becoming Catholic wasn't the thing you did back then out of convenience or for social status. You only converted if you were convinced it was true and your conscience forced you to follow the truth. Well, that was certainly the case with this family. So many members became Catholic, and most of them even took the step of entering religious life. The father of the family was Daniel Barber. He was born in 1756 to a Puritan Congregationalist family in Connecticut. He signed up to fight with the Continental Army in the War for Independence, eventually being discharged and going home due to illness. He became a Congregationalist minister, but eventually he became an Episcopalian priest. He actually baptized Fanny Allen, the daughter of Revolutionary War hero Ethan Allen, while he was an Episcopalian priest. Fanny Allen actually became Catholic after that and a cloistered nun. We'll tell her incredible story in the not-so-distant future. But as for Barbara, the reason he became Episcopalian was actually significant. It started when he took part in, in some debates with Episcopalians about what it means to be a minister. Barber believed that all baptized Christians had the same sort of ministry by virtue of their baptism, but some just chose to dedicate their lives to nothing but teaching and preaching. The ordination ceremony was nothing more than a designation that this person will do nothing but teach and preach, but the ceremony itself imparts nothing special. The Episcopalians argued that there was something different about the ordained priesthood, that it was different in character from the priesthood of all believers. They further argued that apostolic succession mattered. That is, it matters that the one imparting the ordination stands in direct succession from the apostles. The argument unsettled Barber. He realized that the evidence of scripture and tradition backed it up. He took his concerns to his peers and his elder colleagues. None could answer. Most just said, well, that question has been settled. We don't talk about it. But that didn't sit well with Daniel Barber, so he became Episcopalian. And at 30 years old in 1787, he got himself ordained an Episcopalian priest. About that time, he also got married to Chloe Case. Chloe and Daniel Barber had three sons and a daughter, and life was going well as an Episcopalian priest. The family moved to Claremont, New Hampshire, where he had a congregation. Things went fairly smoothly for the Barbers for many years. One of Daniel's sons, Virgil, who was born in 1782, eventually got married and he also became an Episcopalian priest. The first inkling that things might not be settled for the Barbers came in 1812. Daniel came upon the writings of an English Catholic bishop named John Milner concerning Anglican and Episcopalian orders. Milner argued, and he made the case well, that Anglican and Episcopalian orders did not enjoy apostolic succession. So now, the argument that convinced Daniel Barber to become Episcopalian suddenly was going to upset his comfortable Episcopalian existence. The Episcopalians mostly had the right idea, they just didn't realize that their own ordinations also didn't meet the requirements that they argued for. The crux of the matter for Anglican and Episcopalian orders was what happened in 1558 and 1559. The last Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury, Reginald Cardinal Pole, died in 1558. This meant that every see in England was vacant, and there were no formerly Catholic bishops to carry on the apostolic line. But Elizabeth needed bishops, so she appointed some. The men she chose had, in fact, been validly ordained Catholic priests, but none of them was actually a bishop. Also, they all had been excommunicated by virtue of accepting the spiritual authority of the monarch of England as supreme head of the church in England. So these men accepted their appointments by Elizabeth, and they all set about consecrating each other bishop. So, 
since all Anglican bishops, and that includes Episcopalian bishops, trace their consecrations to this action, they all utterly lack apostolic succession. Therefore, they are not bishops in the line of apostles. And that means no priests ordained by them are priests of the church Christ founded. Right. Barber took this question to other Episcopalian priests and bishops. None could provide an explanation. Few even tried. Later that year, 1812, he was in Boston for an Episcopalian conference, and while there he made a point to visit the Catholic Bishop of Boston, the learned and well-respected Jean-Louis Chevreux. Chevreux, whose story we'll be telling in a few weeks, was only too happy to receive Barber. They talked on many points of doctrine, including the nature of orders. Chevreux did what every great spiritual teacher does. He sent Barber away with arms full of books on the questions asked. Barber accepted them gratefully and took them back to Claremont. He studied them carefully, and he shared them with his family, including his son Virgil and wife Jerusha. His family seemed to take no note, even acting annoyed at his constant questioning. But the leaders of his congregation took a more strident position. They demanded he get rid of the offensive papist books. Barber agreed to keep the books to himself, and he locked them up. But the wheels were set in motion. It would take another six years for his conscience to act on the implications. After all, he had good friends. His position was comfortable. He had a wife and children to consider. But the wheels were most definitely in motion. What finally pushed him to accept reality was his son's actions. Yes, his son Virgil, who, again, was also an Episcopalian priest. He became the head of a good school in Waterbury, Connecticut. One day, he randomly came upon a small novena booklet about St. Francis Xavier. A young Irish servant girl who worked in his home had left it lying around. Randomly. Yes, I'm sure she got in trouble for her actions being so careless. I'm sure her guardian angel and Virgil's guardian angel arranged the carelessness. Of course, Mm -hmm. I'm sure they did. Virgil was inspired by the great Jesuit missionary. He took the story of St. Francis Xavier to his wife and to his fellow Episcopalian clergy, exclaiming that the Protestants had never produced anyone like him. All were annoyed by his sudden fondness for Catholicism. Virgil continued studying the question, and his wife, a very well-educated woman, kept up with him and would debate with him the points of theology. Finally, Virgil went to see his superior, Bishop James Hobart. Hobart, at first, wouldn't take Virgil seriously and only barely tried to refute his arguments or even answer his points. In exasperation during the conversation, Virgil was standing silently near an open window. In through that window came the strains of music from a nearby Catholic church. Virgil turned to Bishop Hobart and asked, referencing the Catholics, Do you think that those can be saved? Bishop Hobart smiled and responded, They have the old religion, don't you know? But they do too much, and one can be saved without so much trouble. Go back home in peace, and if you choose to do so, consult your brother ministers and your religious scruples will soon vanish away. Well, they didn't. No. In fact, the next thing that shook his faith was learning about the court case of Father Anthony Coleman back in 1813. We talked about this way back in episode two. Father Coleman was a priest at St. Peter Church in New York. He learned something in the confessional that had to do with a theft. The prosecutors knew he knew who the thief was, and they took him to court to force him to break the seal of confession. He refused. Eventually, the mayor of New York City sided with him, and the seal of confession was protected. Again, the example of a priest living his vows made an impact. Finally, in 1816, Virgil went to visit Father Benedict Fenwick, who was vicar general of New York at the time. Fenwick would eventually become the second bishop of Boston. Father Fenwick received Virgil and helped him through his many questions, and by the end of their sessions, Virgil and his wife, Jerusha, came into the faith in 1816. This dramatic step meant leaving behind the posh position he'd enjoyed, but Fenwick invited the barbers, Virgil and Jerusha, to found a school in New York City. They happily accepted. When they moved into their new home, they discovered that their next-door neighbor was none other than Bishop Hobart. 1817 brought more converts. That year, Daniel Barber and his sister, Abigail Tyler, went to visit Virgil and Jerusha in New York, While there, they met the Dominican priest, Father Charles French, who was in residence at St. Peter. Abigail had been interested in Catholicism for a while, and this visit with Father French clinched it. 
Before they left New York, Abigail had become Catholic. Later that year, Father French accompanied Virgil and Jerusha on a trip to Daniel's home in Claremont, where he offered Mass and gave a series of talks. By the end of the talks, Chloe Barber, Daniel's wife, became Catholic, as did their other two children, their daughter Laura and their son Trueworth. Daniel was the last holdout at this point. But again, the wheels were in motion. He would last until sometime in 1818 when his obvious movements toward Catholicism made the leaders of his church vote for his dismissal on November 12, 1818. Three days later, he gave his tear-filled final sermon. He went for a time to stay with the Jesuits in Maryland. And where did he visit them? Well, at St. Inigo's, which is way down near the end of the, of the Potomac River. It's just downstream of historic St. Mary's City, and the Church of St. Francis Xavier is right there. Yeah, and is on our itinerary for our pilgrimage to Maryland and Virginia. This is a great trip. Information is available through AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash pilgrimages. During this stay with the Jesuits, Daniel Barber finally accepted his life's trajectory, and he too became Catholic. Daniel was in his 62nd year when he became Catholic. After this, Daniel and Chloe lived near Virgil, helping him in a number of pursuits, including establishing the first Catholic parish in New Hampshire. Daniel's wife, Chloe, died in 1825, and Daniel spent the rest of his life living in Jesuit communities in Maryland and Pennsylvania. He never pursued the Catholic priesthood, saying that he had taught too many heresies in his younger days to be worthy of that calling. But the buzz continued among Episcopalians who were shocked to see this entire family of respectable, upstanding, educated Episcopalians, including two priests, become Catholic. Daniel Barber died in 1834 in St. Inigo's, where he was buried. His last words were, I have lost nothing. The conversion of the Barbers would cause a ripple throughout the Episcopalian community for decades. And there are two postscripts on this story. The first concerns the family of Daniel Barber's sister, Abigail. Most of her family, including her husband and all of their children, also became Catholic, with their son, William Tyler, being named the first Bishop of Hartford, Connecticut in 1843. Four of William's sisters became Sisters of Charity. The other postscript is about Virgil, Jerusha, and their children. The rest of the story of this part of the Barber family is worthy of an episode all of its own. They both, Virgil and Jerusha, entered religious life. The children were raised by the church. It's a crazy story that we'll tell at some future date. Suffice to say, the Barber family, through their fidelity to truth and devotion to duty, had a significant and lasting impact on the church in this country. But as for Daniel Barber, if you join us on our pilgrimage to Maryland and Virginia, you'll be able to stop and pray at his grave in St. Inigos, Maryland, and pray for the repose of the soul of one of the most interesting early converts of the church in America. This has been American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by the StarQuest Production Network. If you enjoy American Catholic History, become a supporter on Locals or Patreon. Get information about both and the perks of being a supporter at AmericanCatholicHistory.org slash support. Also, on our website, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about the Barber family, see our upcoming pilgrimages, and find other episodes. And be sure to check out our sponsor, Beatrix Media, providing writing, digital marketing, website strategy and construction, and search engine optimization services. Visit BeatrixMedia.com. Experience your world communicated. We love getting your feedback and suggestions for episodes. You can email us at feedback at AmericanCatholicHistory.org. Find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash American Catholic History, on Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow us on Twitter at ACH1513. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History, sponsored by Beatrix Media and produced by StarQuest.